The Story of Ji Zuck By Jack London There have been renunciations and renunciations. But, in its essence, renunciation is ever the same. And the paradox of it is, that men and women forego the dearest thing in the world for something dearer. It was never otherwise. Thus it was when Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. The firstlings and the fat thereof were to him the dearest things in the world, yet he gave them over that he might be on good terms with God. So it was with Abraham when he prepared to offer up his son Isaac on a stone. Isaac was very dear to him, but God, in incomprehensible ways, was yet dearer. It may be that Abraham feared the Lord. But whether that be true or not it has since been determined by a few billion people that he loved the Lord and desired to serve him. And since it has been determined that love is service, and since to renounce is to serve, then Jesus, who was merely a woman of a swart-skinned breed, loved with a great love. She was unversed in history, having learned to read only the signs of weather and of game, so she had never heard of Abel nor of Abraham, nor, having escaped the good sisters at Holy Cross, had she been told the story of Ruth, the Moabitess, who renounced her very God for the sake of a stranger woman from a strange land. Jesus had learned only one way of renouncing, and that was with a club as the dynamic factor, in much the same manner as a dog is made to renounce a stolen marrowbone. Yet, when the time came, she proved herself capable of rising to the height of the fair-faced royal races and of renouncing in right regal fashion. So this is the story of G. Zuck, which is also the story of Neil Bonner, and Kitty Bonner, and a couple of Neil Bonner's progeny. G. Zuck was of a swart-skinned breed, it is true, but she was not an Indian, nor was she an Eskimo, nor even an Inuit. Going backward into mouth tradition, there appears the figure of one Skulks, a Toyot Indian of the Yukon, who journeyed down in his youth to the great delta where dwell the Inuits, and where he foregathered with a woman remembered as Alali. Now the woman Alali had been bred from an Eskimo mother by an Inuit man. And from Skulks and Alali came Haley, who was one half Toyot Indian, one quarter Inuit, and one quarter Eskimo. And Haley was the grandmother of Jizak. Now Haley, in whom three stocks had been bastardized, who cherished no prejudice against further admixture, mated with a Russian fur trader called Shpak, also known in his time as the Big Fat. Shpak is herein classed Russian for lack of a more adequate term, for Shpak's father, a Slavonic convict from the lower provinces, had escaped from the Quicksilver mines into northern Siberia, where he knew Zimba, who was a woman of the dear people and who became the mother of Shpak who became the grandfather of Jizak. Now had not Shpak been captured in his boyhood by the sea people, who fringed the rim of the Arctic Sea with their misery, he would not have become the grandfather of Jizak and there would be no story at all. But he was captured by the sea people, from whom he escaped to Kamchatka, and thence, on a Norwegian whale ship, to the Baltic. Not long after that he turned up in St. Petersburg, and the years were not many till he went drifting east over the same weary road his father had measured with blood and groans a half century before. But Shpak was a free man, in the employ of the great Russian fur company. And in that employ he fared farther and farther east, until he crossed Bering Sea into Russian America, and at Pastolik, which is hard by the great delta of the Yukon, became the husband of Haley, who was the grandmother of Jizak. Out of this union came the woman-child, Tuxan. Shpak, under the orders of the company, made a canoe voyage of a few hundred miles up the Yukon to the post of Nulato. With him he took Haley and the babe Tuxan. This was in 1850, and in 1850 it was that the river Indians fell upon Nulato and wiped it from the face of the earth. And that was the end of Shpak and Haley. On that terrible night Tuxan disappeared. To this day the Toyots aver they had no hand in the trouble, but, be that as it may, the fact remains that the babe Tuxan grew up among them. Tuxan was married successively to two Toyot brothers, to both of whom she was barren. Because of this, other women shook their heads, and no third Toyot man could be found to dare matrimony with the childless widow. But at this time, many hundred miles above, at Fort Yukon, 
was a man, Spike O'Brien. Fort Yukon was a Hudson Bay Company post, and Spike O'Brien one of the company's servants. He was a good servant, but he achieved an opinion that the service was bad, and in the course of time vindicated that opinion by deserting. It was a year's journey, by the chain of posts, back to York Factory on Hudson's Bay. Further, being company posts, he knew he could not evade the company's clutches. Nothing retained but to go down the Yukon. It was true no white man had ever gone down the Yukon, and no white man knew whether the Yukon emptied into the Arctic Ocean or Bering Sea, but Spike O'Brien was a Celt, and the promise of danger was a lure he had ever followed. A few weeks later, somewhat battered, rather famished, and about dead with river fever, he drove the nose of his canoe into the earth bank by the village of the Toyots and promptly fainted away. While getting his strength back, in the weeks that followed, he looked upon Tuxan and found her good. Like the father of Shpak, who lived to a ripe old age among the Siberian deer people, Spike O'Brien might have left his aged bones with the Toyots. But romance gripped his heartstrings and would not let him stay. As he had journeyed from York Factory to Fort Yukon, so, first among men, might he journey from Fort Yukon to the sea and win the honor of being the first man to make the Northwest Passage by land. So he departed down the river, won the honor, and was unannaled and unsung. In after years he ran a sailor's boarding house in San Francisco, where he became esteemed a most remarkable liar by virtue of the gospel truths he told. But a child was born to Tuxan, who had been childless. And this child was Ji Zuck. Her lineage has been traced at length to show that she was neither Indian, nor Eskimo, nor Inuit, nor much of anything else, also to show what waves of the generations we are, all of us, and the strange meanderings of the seed from which we spring. What with the vagrant blood in her and the heritage compounded of many races, Ji Zuck developed a wonderful young beauty. Bizarre, perhaps, it was, and oriental enough to puzzle any passing ethnologist. A lithe and slender grace characterized her. Beyond a quickened lilt to the imagination, the contribution of the Celt was in no wise apparent. It might possibly have put the warm blood under her skin, which made her face less swart and her body fairer, but that, in turn, might have come from Spak, the big fat, who inherited the color of his Slavonic father. And, finally, she had great, blazing black eyes the half-cast eye, round, full-orbed, and sensuous, which marks the collision of the dark races with the light. Also, the white blood in her, combined with her knowledge that it was in her, made her, in a way, ambitious. Otherwise by upbringing and an outlook on life, she was wholly and utterly a toyed Indian. One winter, when she was a young woman, Neil Bonner came into her life. But he came into her life, as he had come into the country, somewhat reluctantly. In fact, it was very much against his will, coming into the country. Between a father who clipped coupons and cultivated roses, and a mother who loved the social round, Neil Bonner had gone rather wild. He was not vicious, but a man with meat in his belly and without work in the world has to expend his energy somehow, and Neil Bonner was such a man. And he expended his energy in such a fashion and to such extent that when the inevitable climax came, his father, Neil Bonner, Sr., crawled out of his roses in a panic and looked on his son with a wondering eye. Then he hied himself away to a crony of kindred pursuits, with whom he was wont to confer over coupons and roses, and between the two the destiny of young Neil Bonner was made manifest. He must go away, on probation, to live down his harmless follies in order that he might live up to their own excellent standard. This determined upon, and young Neil a little repentant and a great deal ashamed, the rest was easy. The cronies were heavy stockholders in the P.C. Company. The P.C. Company owned fleets of river steamers and ocean-going craft, and, in addition to farming the sea, exploited a hundred thousand square miles or so of the land that, on the maps of geographers, usually occupies the white spaces. So the P.C. Company sent young Neil Bonner north, where the white spaces are, to do its work and to learn to be good like his father. Five years of simplicity, close to the soil and far from temptation, will make a man of him, 
said old Neil Bonner, and forthwith crawled back among his roses. Young Neil set his jaw, pitched his chin at the proper angle, and went to work. As an underling he did his work well and gained the commendation of his superiors. Not that he delighted in the work, but that it was the one thing that prevented him from going mad. The first year he wished he was dead. The second year he cursed God. The third year he was divided between the two emotions, and in the confusion quarreled with a man in authority. He had the best of the quarrel, though the man in authority had the last word a word that sent Neil Bonner into an exile that made his old billet appear as paradise. But he went without a whimper, for the North had succeeded in making him into a man. Here and there, on the white spaces on the map, little circlets like the letter O are to be found, and, appended to these circlets, on one side or the other, are names such as Fort Hamilton, Yanana Station, Twenty Mile, thus leading one to imagine that the white spaces are plentifully besprinkled with towns and villages. But it is a vain imagining. Twenty Mile, which is very like the rest of the posts, is a log building the size of a corner grocery with rooms to let upstairs. A long-legged cache on stilts may be found in the backyard, also a couple of outhouses. The backyard is unfenced, and extends to the skyline and an unascertainable bit beyond. There are no other houses in sight, though the Toyots sometimes pitch a winter camp a mile or two down the Yukon. And this is Twenty Mile, one tentacle of the many tentacled P.C. Company. Here the agent, with an assistant, barters with the Indians for their furs, and does an erratic trade on a gold dust basis with the wandering miners. Here, also, the agent and his assistant yearn all winter for the spring, and when the spring comes, camp blasphemously on the roof while the Yukon washes out the establishment. And here, also, in the fourth year of his sojourn in the land, came Neil Bonner to take charge. He had displaced no agent, for the man that previously ran the post had made away with himself, because of the rigors of the place, said the assistant, who still remained, though the Toyots, by their fires, had another version. The assistant was a shrunken, shouldered, hollow-chested man, with a cadaverous face and cavernous cheeks that his sparse black beard could not hide. He coughed much, as though consumption gripped his lungs, while his eyes had that mad, fevered light common to consumptives in the last stage. Pentley was his name Amos Pentley and Bonner did not like him, though he felt a pity for the forlorn and hopeless devil. They did not get along together, these two men who, of all men, should have been on good terms in the face of the cold and silence and darkness of the long winter. In the end, Bonner concluded that Amos was partly demented, and left him alone, doing all the work himself except the cooking. Even then, Amos had nothing but bitter looks and an undisguised hatred for him. This was a great loss to Bonner, for the smiling face of one of his own kind, the cheery word, the sympathy of comradeship shared with misfortune these things meant much, and the winter was yet young when he began to realize the added reasons, with such an assistant, that the previous agent had found to impel his own hand against his life. It was very lonely at twenty mile. The bleak vastness stretched away on every side to the horizon. The snow, which was really frost, flung its mantle over the land and buried everything in the silence of death. For days it was clear and cold, the thermometer steadily recording 40 to 50 degrees below zero. Then a change came over the face of things. What little moisture had oozed into the atmosphere gathered into dull gray, formless clouds, it became quite warm, the thermometer rising to 20 below, and the moisture fell out of the sky in hard frost granules that hissed like dry sugar or driving sand when kicked underfoot. After that it became clear and cold again, until enough moisture had gathered to blanket the earth from the cold of outer space. That was all. Nothing happened. No storms, no churning waters and threshing forests, nothing but the machine-like precipitation of accumulated moisture. Possibly the most notable thing that occurred through the weary weeks was the gliding of the temperature up to the unprecedented height of 15 below. 
To atone for this, outer space smote the Earth with its cold till the mercury froze and the spirit thermometer remained more than 70 below for a fortnight, when it burst. There was no telling how much colder it was after that. Another occurrence, monotonous in its regularity, was the lengthening of the nights, till day became a mere blink of light between the darkness. Neil Bonner was a social animal. The very follies for which he was doing penance had been bred of his excessive sociability. And here, in the fourth year of his exile, he found himself in company, which were to travesty the word with a morose and speechless creature in whose somber eyes smoldered a hatred as bitter as it was unwarranted. And Bonner, to whom speech and fellowship were as the breath of life, went about as a ghost might go, tantalized by the gregarious revelries of some former life. In the day his lips were compressed, his face stern, but in the night he clenched his hands, rolled about in his blankets, and cried aloud like a little child. And he would remember a certain man in authority and curse him through the long hours. Also, he cursed God. But God understands. He cannot find it in his heart to blame weak mortals who blaspheme in Alaska. And here, to the post of twenty mile, came G. Zuck, to trade for flour and bacon, and beads, and bright scarlet cloths for her fancy work. And further, and unwittingly, she came to the post of twenty mile to make a lonely man more lonely, make him reach out empty arms in his sleep. For Neil Bonner was only a man. When she first came into the store, he looked at her long, as a thirsty man may look at a flowing well. And she, with the heritage bequeathed her by Spike O'Brien, imagined daringly and smiled up into his eyes, not as the swart-skinned peoples should smile at the royal races, but as a woman smiles at a man. The thing was inevitable, only, he did not see it, and fought against her as fiercely and passionately as he was drawn towards her. And she? She was G. Zuck, by upbringing wholly and utterly a toyed Indian woman. She came often to the post to trade. And often she sat by the big wood stove and chatted in broken English with Neil Bonner. And he came to look for her coming, and on the days she did not come he was worried and restless. Sometimes he stopped to think, and then she was met coldly, with a resolve that perplexed and piqued her, and which, she was convinced, was not sincere. But more often he did not dare to think, and then all went well and there were smiles and laughter. And Amos Pentley, gasping like a stranded catfish, his hollow cough a reek with the grave, looked upon it all and grinned. He, who loved life, could not live, and it rankled his soul that others should be able to live. Wherefore he hated Bonner, who was so very much alive and into whose eyes sprang joy at the sight of G's up. As for Amos, the very thought of the girl was sufficient to send his blood pounding up into a hemorrhage. G. Zuck, whose mind was simple, who thought elementally and was unused to weighing life in its subtler quantities, read Amos Pentley like a book. She warned Bonner, openly and bluntly, in few words, but the complexities of higher existence confused the situation to him, and he laughed at her evident anxiety. To him Amos was a poor, miserable devil, tottering desperately into the grave. And Bonner, who had suffered much, found it easy to forgive greatly. But one morning, during a bitter snap, he got up from the breakfast table and went into the store. G. Zuck was already there, rosy from the trail, to buy a sack of flour. A few minutes later, he was out in the snow lashing the flour on her sled. As he bent over he noticed a stiffness in his neck and felt a premonition of impending physical misfortune. And as he put the last half hitch into the lashing and attempted to straighten up, a quick spasm seized him and he sank into the snow. Tense and quivering, head jerked back, limbs extended, back arched and mouth twisted and distorted, he appeared as though being racked limb from limb. Without cry or sound, G. Zuck was in the snow beside him, but he clutched both her wrists spasmodically, and as long as the convulsion endured she was helpless. In a few moments the spasm relaxed and he was left weak and fainting, his forehead beaded with sweat and his lips flecked with foam. Quick, he muttered, in a strange, hoarse voice. Quick. Inside. He started to crawl on hands and knees, but she raised him up, 
and, supported by her young arm, he made faster progress. As he entered the store the spasm seized him again, and his body writhed irresistibly away from her and rolled and curled on the floor. Amos Pentley came and looked on with curious eyes. Oh, Amos, she cried in an agony of apprehension and helplessness, him die, you think? But Amos shrugged his shoulders and continued to look on. Bonner's body went slack, the tense muscles easing down and an expression of relief coming into his face. Quick, he gritted between his teeth, his mouth twisting with the oncoming of the next spasm and with his effort to control it. Quick, geez up. The medicine. Never mind. Drag me. She knew where the medicine chest stood, at the rear of the room beyond the stove, and thither, by the legs, she dragged the struggling man. As the spasm passed he began, very faint and very sick, to overhaul the chest. He had seen dogs die exhibiting symptoms similar to his own, and he knew what should be done. He held up a vial of chloral hydrate, but his fingers were too weak and nerveless to draw the cork. This geez up did for him, while he was plunged into another convulsion. As he came out of it he found the open bottle proffered him, and looked into the great black eyes of the woman and read what men have always read in the mate woman's eyes. Taking a full dose of the stuff, he sank back until another spasm had passed. Then he raised himself limply on his elbow. Listen, geez uck, he said very slowly, as though aware of the necessity for haste and yet afraid to hasten. Do what I say. Stay by my side, but do not touch me. I must be very quiet, but you must not go away. His jaw began to set and his face to quiver and distort with the forerunning pangs, but he gulped and struggled to master them. Do not got away. And do not let Amos go away. Understand. Amos must stay right here. She nodded her head, and he passed off into the first of many convulsions, which gradually diminished in force and frequency. Jesuk hung over him remembering his injunction and not daring to touch him. Once Amos grew restless and made as though to go into the kitchen, but a quick blaze from her eyes quelled him, and after that, save for his labored breathing and charnel cough, he was very quiet. Bonner slept. The blink of light that marked the day disappeared. Amos, followed about by the woman's eyes, lighted the kerosene lamps. Evening came on. Through the north window the heavens were emblazoned with an auroral display, which flamed and flared and died down into blackness. Some time after that, Neil Bonner roused. First he looked to see that Amos was still there, then smiled at Jeez Uck and pulled himself up. Every muscle was stiff and sore, and he smiled ruefully, pressing and prodding himself as if to ascertain the extent of the ravage. Then his face went stern and businesslike. Geez uck, he said, take a candle. Go into the kitchen. There is food on the table biscuits and beans and bacon, also, coffee in the pot on the stove. Bring it here on the counter. Also, bring tumblers and water and whiskey, which you will find on the top shelf of the locker. Do not forget the whiskey. Having swallowed a stiff glass of the whiskey, he went carefully through the medicine chest, now and again putting aside, with definite purpose, certain bottles and vials. Then he set to work on the food, attempting a crude analysis. He had not been in use to the laboratory in his college days and was possessed of sufficient imagination to achieve results with his limited materials. The condition of tetanus, which had marked his paroxysms, simplified matters, and he made but one test. The coffee yielded nothing, nor did the beans. To the biscuits he devoted the utmost care. Amos, who knew nothing of chemistry, looked on with steady curiosity. But Jeez Uck, who had boundless faith in the white man's wisdom, and especially in Neil Bonner's wisdom, and who not only knew nothing but knew that she knew nothing watched his face rather than his hands. Step by step he eliminated possibilities, until he came to the final test. He was using a thin medicine veil for a tube, and this he held between him and the light, watching the slow precipitation of a salt through the solution contained in the tube. He said nothing, but he saw what he had expected to see. 
And Ji Zuk, her eyes riveted on his face, saw something too, something that made her spring like a tigress upon Amos, and with splendid suppleness and strength bend his body back across her knee. Her knife was out of its sheath and uplifted, glinting in the lamplight. Amos was snarling, but Bonner intervened ere the blade could fall. That's a good girl, Ji Zuk. But never mind. Let him go. She dropped the man obediently, though with protest writ large on her face, and his body thudded to the floor. Bonner nudged him with his moccasin foot. Get up, Amos, he commanded. You've got to pack an outfit yet tonight and hit the trail. You don't mean to say, Amos blurted savagely. I mean to say that you tried to kill me, Neil went on in cold, even tones. I mean to say that you killed Birdsall, for all the company believes he killed himself. You used strychnine in my case. God knows with what you fixed him. Now I can't hang you. You're too near dead as it is. But twenty mile is too small for the pair of us, and you've got to mush. It's two hundred miles to Holy Cross. You can make it if you're careful not to overexert. I'll give you grub, a sled, and three dogs. You'll be as safe as if you were in jail, for you can't get out of the country. And I'll give you one chance. You're almost dead. Very well. I shall send no word to the company until the spring. In the meantime, the thing for you to do is to die. Now mush. You go to bed. Jesuk insisted, when Amos had churned away into the night towards Holy Cross. You sick man yet, Neil. And you're a good girl, Jesuk, he answered. And here's my hand on it. But you must go home. You don't like me, she said simply. He smiled, helped her on with her parka, and led her to the door. Only too well, Jesuk, he said softly, only too well. After that the pall of the arctic night fell deeper and blacker on the land. Neil Bonner discovered that he had failed to put proper valuation upon even the sullen face of the murderous and death-stricken Amos. It became very lonely at twenty mile. For the love of God, Prentice, send me a man, he wrote to the agent at Fort Hamilton, three hundred miles upriver. Six weeks later the Indian messenger brought back a reply. It was characteristic, hell both feet frozen. Need him myself Prentice. To make matters worse, most of the Toyots were in the back country on the flanks of a caribou herd, and Jeez Uck was with them. Removing to a distance seemed to bring her closer than ever, and Neil Bonner found himself picturing her, day by day, in camp and on trail. It is not good to be alone. Often he went out of the quiet store, bareheaded and frantic, and shook his fist at the blink of day that came over the southern skyline. And on still, cold nights he left his bed and stumbled into the frost, where he assaulted the silence at the top of his lungs, as though it were some tangible, sentiment thing that he might arouse, or he shouted at the sleeping dogs till they howled and howled again. One shaggy brute he brought into the post, playing that it was the new man sent by Prentice. He strove to make it sleep decently under blankets at nights and to sit at table and eat as a man should, but the beast, mere domesticated wolf that it was, rebelled, and sought out dark corners and snarled and bit him in the leg, and was finally beaten and driven forth. Then the trick of personification seized upon Neil Bonner and mastered him. All the forces of his environment metamorphosed into living, breathing entities and came to live with him. He recreated the primitive pantheon, reared an altar to the sun and burned candle fat and bacon grease thereon, and in the unfenced yard, by the long-legged cache, made a frost devil, which he was wont to make faces at and mock when the mercury oozed down into the bulb. All this in play, of course. He said it to himself that it was in play, and repeated it over and over to make sure, unaware that madness is ever prone to express itself in make-believe and play. One midwinter day, Father Champro, a Jesuit missionary, pulled into Twenty Mile. Bonner fell upon him and dragged him into the post, and clung to him and wept, until the priest wept with him from sheer compassion. Then Bonner became madly hilarious and made lavish entertainment, 
swearing valiantly that his guest should not depart. But Father Champro was pressing to salt water on urgent business for his order, and pulled out next morning, with Bonner's blood threatened on his head. And the threat was in a fair way toward realization, when the Toyots returned from their long hunt to the winter camp. They had many furs, and there was much trading and stir at Twenty Mile. Also, Jizuk came to buy beads and scarlet cloths and things, and Bonner began to find himself again. He fought for a week against her. Then the end came one night when she rose to leave. She had not forgotten her repulse, and the pride that drove Spike O'Brien on to complete the Northwest Passage by land was her pride. I go now, she said, good night, Neil. But he came up behind her. Nay, it is not well, he said. And as she turned her face toward his with a sudden joyful flash, he bent forward, slowly and gravely, as it were a sacred thing, and kissed her on the lips. The Toyots had never taught her the meaning of a kiss upon the lips, but she understood and was glad. With the coming of Jizuk, at once things brightened up. She was regal in her happiness, a source of unending delight. The elemental workings of her mind and her naive little ways made an immense sum of pleasurable surprise to the over-civilized man that had stooped to catch her up. Not alone was she solace to his loneliness, but her primitiveness rejuvenated his jaded mind. It was as though, after long wandering, he had returned to pillow his head in the lap of Mother Earth. In short, in Jizuk he found the youth of the world the youth and the strength and the joy. And to fill the full round of his need, and that they might not see over much of each other, there arrived at twenty mile one Sandy McPherson, as companionable a man as ever whistled along the trail or raised a ballad by a campfire. A Jesuit priest had run into his camp, a couple of hundred miles up the Yukon, in the nick of time to say a last word over the body of Sandy's partner. And on departing, the priest had said, My son, you will be lonely now. And Sandy had bowed his head brokenly. At twenty mile, the priest added, There is a lonely man. You have need of each other, my son. So it was that Sandy became a welcome third at the post, brother to the man and woman that resided there. He took Bonner moose hunting and wolf trapping, and, in return, Bonner resurrected a battered and wayworn volume and made him friends with Shakespeare, till Sandy declaimed iambic pentameters to his sled dogs whenever they waxed mutinous. And of the long evenings they played cribbage and talked and disagreed about the universe, the while Jizuk rocked matronly in an easy chair and darned their moccasins and socks. Spring came. The sun shot up out of the south. The land exchanged its austere robes for the garb of a smiling wanton. Everywhere light laughed and life invited. The days stretched out their balmy length and the nights passed from blinks of darkness to no darkness at all. The river bared its bosom, and snorting steamboats challenged the wilderness. There were stir and bustle, new faces, and fresh facts. An assistant arrived at Twenty Mile, and Sandy McPherson wandered off with a bunch of prospectors to invade the Koyukuk country. And there were newspapers and magazines and letters for Neil Bonner. And Jeez Uck looked on in worriment, for she knew his kindred talked with him across the world. Without much shock, it came to him that his father was dead. There was a sweet letter of forgiveness, dictated in his last hours. There were official letters from the company, graciously ordering him to turn the post over to the assistant and permitting him to depart at his earliest pleasure. A long, legal affair from the lawyers informed him of interminable lists of stocks and bonds, real estate, rents, and chattels that were his by his father's will. And a dainty bit of stationery, sealed and monogrammed, implored dear Neil's return to his heartbroken and loving mother. Neil Bonner did some swift thinking, and when the Yukon Bell coughed into the bank on her way down to Bering Sea, he departed, departed with the ancient lie of quick return young and blithe on his lips. I'll come back, dear G. Zuck, before the first snow flies, he promised her, between the last kisses at the gangplank. And not only did he promise, but, like the majority of men under the same circumstances, he really meant it. To John Thompson, the new agent, 
he gave orders for the extension of unlimited credit to his wife, Ji Zuck. Also, with his last look from the deck of the Yukon Bell, he saw a dozen men at work rearing the logs that were to make the most comfortable house along a thousand miles of river front the house of Ji Zuck, and likewise the house of Neil Bonnerere the first flurry of snow. For he fully and fondly meant to come back. Ji Zuck was dear to him, and, further, a golden future awaited the North. With his father's money he intended to verify that future. An ambitious dream allured him. With his four years of experience, and aided by the friendly cooperation of the P.C. Company, he would return to become the roads of Alaska. And he would return, fast as steam could drive, as soon as he had put into shape the affairs of his father, whom he had never known, and comforted his mother, whom he had forgotten. There was much ado when Neil Bonner came back from the Arctic. The fires were lighted and the flesh pots slung, and he took of it all and called it good. Not only was he bronzed and creased, but he was a new man under his skin, with a grip on things and a seriousness and control. His old companions were amazed when he declined to hit up the pace in the good old way, while his father's crony rubbed hands gleefully, and became an authority upon the reclamation of wayward and idle youth. For four years Neil Bonner's mind had lain fallow. Little that was new had been added to it, but it had undergone a process of selection. It had, so to say, been purged of the trivial and superfluous. He had lived quick years, down in the world, and, up in the wilds, time had been given him to organize the confused mass of his experiences. His superficial standards had been flung to the winds and new standards erected on deeper and broader generalizations. Concerning civilization, he had gone away with one set of values, had returned with another set of values. Aided, also, by the earth smells in his nostrils and the earth sights in his eyes, he laid hold of the inner significance of civilization, beholding with clear vision its futilities and powers. It was a simple little philosophy he evolved. Clean living was the way to grace. Duty performed was sanctification. One must live clean and do his duty in order that he might work. Work was salvation. And to work toward life abundant, and more abundant, was to be in line with the scheme of things and the will of God. Primarily, he was of the city. And his fresh earth grip and virile conception of humanity gave him a finer sense of civilization and endeared civilization to him. Day by day the people of the city clung closer to him and the world loomed more colossal. And, day by day, Alaska grew more remote and less real. And then he met Kitty Sharon a woman of his own flesh and blood and kind, a woman who put her hand into his hand and drew him to her till he forgot the day and hour and the time of the year the first snow flies on the Yukon. Jeez Uck moved into her grand log house and dreamed away three golden summer months. Then came the autumn, post-haste before the down rush of winter. The air grew thin and sharp, the days thin and short. The river ran sluggishly, and skin ice formed in the quiet eddies. All migratory life departed south, and silence fell upon the land. The first snow flurries came, and the last homing steamboat bucked desperately into the running mush ice. Then came the hard ice, solid cakes and sheets, till the Yukon ran level with its banks. And when all this ceased the river stood still and the blinking days lost themselves in the darkness. John Thompson, the new agent, laughed, but Jesuk had faith in the mischances of sea and river. Neil Bonner might be frozen in anywhere between Chilkoot Pass and St. Michael's, for the last travelers of the year are always caught by the ice, when they exchange boat for sled and dash on through the long hours behind the flying dogs. But no flying dogs came up the trail, nor down the trail, to Twenty Mile. And John Thompson told G. Zuck, with a certain gladness ill-concealed, that Bonner would never come back again. Also, and brutally, he suggested his own eligibility. Jeez Uck laughed in his face and went back to her grand log house. But when midwinter came, when hope dies down and life is at its lowest ebb, Jeez Uck found she had no credit at the store. This was Thompson's doing, and he rubbed his hands, and walked up and down, and came to his door and looked up at Jeez Uck's house and waited. 
and he continued to wait. She sold her dog team to a party of miners and paid cash for her food. And when Thompson refused to honor even her coin, Toyot Indians made her purchases, and sled them up to her house in the dark. In February the first post came in over the ice, and John Thompson read in the society column of a five-months-old paper of the marriage of Neil Bonner and Kitty Sharon. Jesuk held the door ajar and him outside while he imparted the information, and, when he had done, laughed pridefully and did not believe. In March, and all alone, she gave birth to a man-child, a brave bit of new life at which she marveled. And at that hour, a year later, Neil Bonner sat by another bed, marveling at another bit of new life that had fared into the world. The snow went off the ground and the ice broke out of the Yukon. The sun journeyed north, and journeyed south again, and, the money from the being spent, Jizuk went back to her own people. Okish, a shrewd hunter, proposed to kill the meat for her and her babe, and catch the salmon, if she would marry him. And Imago and Hayo and W.Y. Nuch, husky young hunters all, made similar proposals. But she elected to live alone and seek her own meat and fish. She sewed moccasins and parkas and mittens warm, serviceable things, and pleasing to the eye, withal, what of the ornamental hair tufts and beadwork. These she sold to the miners, who were drifting faster into the land each year. And not only did she win food that was good and plentiful, but she laid money by, and one day took passage on the Yukon Bell down the river. At St. Michael's she washed dishes in the kitchen of the post. The servants of the company wondered at the remarkable woman with the remarkable child, though they asked no questions and she vouchsafed nothing. But just before Bering Sea closed in for the year, she bought a passage south on a strayed sealing schooner. That winter she cooked for Captain Markiam's household at Unalaska, and in the spring continued south to Sitka on a whiskey sloop. Later on appeared at Metlakotla, which is near to St. Mary's on the end of the Panhandle, where she worked in the cannery through the salmon season. When autumn came and the Siwash fishermen prepared to return to Puget Sound, she embarked with a couple of families in a big cedar canoe, and with them she threaded the hazardous chaos of the Alaskan and Canadian coasts, till the Straits of Juan de Fuca were passed and she led her boy by the hand up the hard pave of Seattle. There she met Sandy McPherson, on a windy corner, very much surprised and, when he had heard her story, very wroth not so wroth as he might have been, had he known of Kitty Sharon, but of her Jesuk breathed not a word, for she had never believed. Sandy, who read commonplace and sordid desertion into the circumstance, strove to dissuade her from her trip to San Francisco, where Neil Bonner was supposed to live when he was at home. And, having striven, he made her comfortable, bought her tickets and saw her off, the while smiling in her face and muttering damn shame into his beard. With roar and rumble, through daylight and dark, swaying and lurching between the dawns, soaring into the winter snows and sinking to summer valleys, skirting depths, leaping chasms, piercing mountains, Jees Uck and her boy were hurled south. But she had no fear of the Iron Stallion, nor was she stunned by this masterful civilization of Neil Bonner's people. It seemed, rather, that she saw with greater clearness the wonder that a man of such godlike race had held her in his arms. The screaming medley of San Francisco, with its restless shipping, belching factories, and thundering traffic, did not confuse her, instead, she comprehended swiftly the pitiful sordidness of Twenty Mile and the skin-lodged Toyot village. And she looked down at the boy that clutched her hand and wondered that she had borne him by such a man. She paid the hack driver five pieces and went up the stone steps of Neil Bonner's front door. A slant-eyed Japanese parleyed with her for a fruitless space, then led her inside and disappeared. She remained in the hall, which to her simply fancy seemed to be the guestroom the showplace wherein were arrayed all the household treasures with the frank purpose of parade and dazzlement. The walls and ceiling were of oiled and panelled redwood. The floor was more glassy than glare ice, and she sought standing place on one of the great skins that gave a sense of security to the polished surface. A huge fireplace an extravagant fireplace, she deemed it yawned in the farther wall. A flood of light, mellowed by stained glass, fell across the room, and from the far end came the white gleam of a marble figure. 
This much she saw, and more, when the slant-eyed servant led the way past another room of which she caught a fleeting glance and into a third, both of which dimmed the brave show of the entrance hall. And to her eyes the great house seemed to hold out the promise of endless similar rooms. There was such length and breadth to them, and the ceilings were so far away. For the first time since her advent into the white man's civilization, a feeling of awe laid hold of her. Neil, her Neil, lived in this house, breathed the air of it, and lay down at night and slept. It was beautiful, all this that she saw, and it pleased her, but she felt, also, the wisdom and mastery behind. It was the concrete expression of power in terms of beauty, and it was the power that she unerringly divined. And then came a woman, queenly tall, crowned with a glory of hair that was like a golden sun. She seemed to come toward Jesus as a ripple of music across still water, her sweeping garment itself a song, her body playing rhythmically beneath. Jesus herself was a man compeller. There were Oakish and Imago and Hayo and W. Y. Nuch, to say nothing of Neil Bonner and John Thompson and other white men that had looked upon her and felt her power. But she gazed upon the wide blue eyes and rose-white skin of this woman that advanced to meet her, and she measured her with woman's eyes looking through man's eyes, and as a man compeller she felt herself diminish and grow insignificant before this radiant and flashing creature. You wish to see my husband, the woman asked, and Jesus gasped at the liquid silver of a voice that had never sounded harsh cries at snarling wolf dogs, nor molded itself to a guttural speech, nor toughened in storm and frost and camp smoke. No, Jesus answered slowly and gropingly, in order that she might do justice to her English. I come to see Neil Bonner. He is my husband, the woman laughed. Then it was true. John Thompson had not lied that bleak February day, when she laughed pridefully and shut the door in his face. As once she had thrown Amos Pentley across her knee and ripped her knife into the air, so now she felt impelled to spring upon this woman and bear her back and down, and tear the life out of her fair body. But Jesus was thinking quickly and gave no sign, and Kitty Bonner little dreamed how intimately she had for an instant been related with sudden death. Jesus nodded her head that she understood, and Kitty Bonner explained that Neil was expected at any moment. Then they sat down on ridiculously comfortable chairs, and Kitty sought to entertain her strange visitor, and Jesus strove to help her. You knew my husband in the North? Kitty asked, once. Sure. I wash um clothes, Jesus had answered, her English abruptly beginning to grow atrocious. And this is your boy. I have a little girl. Kitty caused her daughter to be brought, and while the children, after their manner, struck an acquaintance, the mothers indulged in the talk of mothers and drank tea from cups so fragile that Jesus feared lest hers should crumble to pieces beneath her fingers. Never had she seen such cups, so delicate and dainty. In her mind she compared them with the woman who poured the tea, and their uprose in contrast the gourds and pannikins of the Toyot village and the clumsy mugs of Twenty Mile, to which she likened herself. And in such fashion and such terms the problem presented itself. She was beaten. There was a woman other than herself better fitted to bear and upbring Neil Bonner's children. Just as his people exceeded her people, so did his womankind exceed her. They were the man compellers, as their men were the world compellers. She looked at the rose-white tenderness of Kitty Bonner's skin and remembered the sunbeat on her own face. Likewise she looked from brown hand to white the one, work-worn and hardened by whip handle and paddle, the other as guiltless of toil and soft as a newborn babe's. And, for all the obvious softness and apparent weakness, Jesus looked into the blue eyes and saw the mastery she had seen in Neil Bonner's eyes and in the eyes of Neil Bonner's people. Why, it's Jesus, Neil Bonner said, when he entered. He said it calmly, with even a ring of joyful cordiality, coming over to her and shaking both her hands, but looking into her eyes with a worry in his own that she understood. Hello, Neil, she said. You look much good. Fine, fine, Jesus, he answered heartily, though secretly studying Kitty for some sign of what had passed between the two. 
yet he knew his wife too well to expect, even though the worst had passed, such a sign. Well, I can't say how glad I am to see you, he went on. What's happened? Did you strike a mine? And when did you get in? Ooh eh, hey, I get in today, she replied, her voice instinctively seeking its guttural parts. I know strike it, Neil. You known Captain Markheim, on Alaska. I cook, his house, long time. No spend money. By'm by, plenty. Pretty good, I think, go down and see white man's land. Very fine, white man's land, very fine, she added. Her English puzzled him, for Sandy and he had sought, constantly, to better her speech, and she had proved an apt pupil. Now it seemed that she had sunk back into her race. Her face was guileless, stolidly guileless, giving no cue. Kitty's untroubled brow likewise baffled him. What had happened? How much had been said? And how much guessed? While he wrestled with these questions and while Jizuk wrestled with her problem never had he looked so wonderful and great a silence fell. To think that you knew my husband in Alaska. Kitty said softly. Knew him. Jizuk could not forbear a glance at the boy she had borne him, and his eyes followed hers mechanically to the window where played the two children. An iron hand seemed to tighten across his forehead. His knees went weak and his heart leaped up and pounded like a fist against his breast. His boy. He had never dreamed it. Little Kitty Bonner, fairy-like in gauzy lawn, with pinkest of cheeks and bluest of dancing eyes, arms outstretched and lips puckered in invitation, was striving to kiss the boy. And the boy, lean and lithe, sun-beaten and browned, skin-clad and in hair, fringed and hair-tufted mucklucks that showed the wear of the sea and rough work, coolly withstood her advances, his body straight and stiff with the peculiar erectness common to children of savage people. A stranger in a strange land, unabashed and unafraid, he appeared more like an untamed animal, silent and watchful, his black eyes flashing from face to face, quiet so long as quiet endured, but prepared to spring and fight and tear and scratch for life at the first sign of danger. The contrast between boy and girl was striking, but not pitiful. There was too much strength in the boy for that, waif that he was of the generations of Spack, Spike O'Brien, and Bonner. In his features, clean-cut as a cameo and almost classic in their severity, there were the power and achievement of his father, and his grandfather, and the one known as the Big Fat, who was captured by the Sea People and escaped to Kamchatka. Neil Bonner fought his emotion down, swallowed it down, and choked over it, though his face smiled with good humor and the joy with which one meets a friend. Your boy, eh, geez uck, he said. And then turning to Kitty, handsome fellow. He'll do something with those two hands of his in this our world. Kitty nodded concurrence. What is your name, she asked. The young savage flashed his quick eyes upon her and dwelt over her for a space, seeking out, as it were, the motive beneath the question. Neil, he answered deliberately when the scrutiny had satisfied him. Injun talk, Jizuk interposed, glibly manufacturing languages on the spur of the moment. Him Injun talk, N-E-A-L all the same, cracker. Him baby, him like cracker, him cry for cracker. Him say, N-E-A-L, N-E-A-L, all time him say, N-E-A-L, then I say that um name. So um name all time Neal. Never did sound more blessed fall upon Neil Bonner's ear than that lie from G's Uck's lips. It was the cue, and he knew there was reason for Kitty's untroubled brow. And his father? Kitty asked. He must be a fine man. Ooh a. Yes, was the reply. Um father fine man. Sure. Did you know him, Neil? queried Kitty. Know him? Most intimately, Neil answered, and harked back to dreary twenty mile and the man alone in the silence with his thoughts. And here might well end the story of Jizuk but for the crown she put upon her renunciation.
When she returned to the north to dwell in her grand log house, John Thompson found that the P.C. Company could make a shift somehow to carry on its business without his aid. Also, the new agent and the succeeding agents received instructions that the woman G's Uck should be given whatsoever goods and grub she desired, in whatsoever quantities she ordered, and that no charge should be placed upon the books. Further, the company paid yearly to the woman G's Uck a pension of $5,000. When he had attained suitable age, Father Champro laid hands upon the boy, and the time was not long when Jesuk received letters regularly from the Jesuit College in Maryland. Later on these letters came from Italy, and still later from France. And in the end there returned to Alaska one Father Neil, a man mighty for good in the land, who loved his mother and who ultimately went into a wider field and rose to high authority in the order. Jesuk was a young woman when she went back into the north, and men still looked upon her and yearned. But she lived straight, and no breath was ever raised save in commendation. She stayed for a while with the good sisters at Holy Cross, where she learned to read and write and became versed in practical medicine and surgery. After that she returned to her grand log house and gathered about her the young girls of the Toyot village, to show them the way of their feet in the world. It is neither Protestant nor Catholic, this school and the house built by Neil Bonner for Jesuk, his wife, but the missionaries of all the sects look upon it with equal favor. The latch string is always out, and tired prospectors and trail-weary men turn aside from the flowing river or frozen trail to rest there for a space and be warmed by her fire. And, down in the States, Kitty Bonner is pleased at the interest her husband takes in Alaskan education and the large sums he devotes to that purpose, and, though she often smiles and chaffs, deep down and secretly she is but the prouder of him.